sky is for everyone. can fly. Not so long ago, words like these brought people out into the streets to gaze up with wonder at a man in flight. Even today, some of that feeling still hangs over. And often when we think of flying, we think of adventurers guiding their airborne galleys into an element unknown to ordinary mortals. Or we think of great airliners spanning the oceans and linking the continents as they carry the glamorous, the important, and the elite of the world on their high concerns. True, once the sky was for the few. More recently, the sky has been for the many, for many people and for many purposes, for crop dusting and insect control, for freighting goods to places hitherto considered out of reach, keeping the pioneers in the bush country in touch with civilization, speeding the mails and a hundred other special jobs, often done by special airplanes designed for their special purpose. The special purpose of the huge long-haul transport is to shrink the distances of a continent to those of a single state. And for some years now, every large city in our country has been within just a few hours air travel of every other. It's these huge four-engine airliners whose great speed and dependability and comfort have taken flying beyond the few and given it to the many. And in the process have created the need for the new airplane, which now completes the picture. A new airplane designed and developed for the special purpose of shrinking the more intimate distances, the distances between cities and towns in the same region. Now every city, great or small, can be tied to the main line. No longer is the sky for the few, nor even for the many. Now the sky is for everyone. This new airplane is a full-scale transport in everything but range. On every test flight, it's standard procedure to cut off one engine. The conveyor not only holds its altitude comfortably, but actually keeps on climbing. These engines, in fact, are exactly the same engines which United uses on its non-stop DC-6s, giving the conveyor the reserve power to lift it quickly out of the smaller airfields and to fly the multiple stop schedules at long-haul speeds. Since all United's conveyor routes work out of big city terminals, these planes get the same hangar service as their long-haul brothers. Almost a thousand square feet of metal wing area plus the oversized flaps provide fast lift for short runways. And the fuel load in the 1,700 gallon tanks is always figured for at least an hour's extra travel beyond the farthest scheduled destination. Even at the full load of 44 passengers, the mail, and a ton and a half of cargo for merchants and manufacturers and service companies. In the cities along the multiple stop route. To get the passengers on and off quickly, at airports with small ground crews, this special purpose airplane carries its own landing steps and secures its own doors. A few minutes saved at each of several stops can give the passengers just that much extra time in the terminal city or at home. This flight began for the captain and the first officer more than an hour ago when they reported at the field operations office to check the weather along the route and lay out their detailed flight plan. And when the tower radios down their clearance to taxi, they're ready to roll.
runway when they complete the cross check of each instrument and control which must precede every takeoff. They hear flight 335 cleared for takeoff. And they're on their way. Off to what once would have been the wild blue yonder. But now it's just an ordinary routine day's work. with the landing gear tucked up out of the screen, there's still enough clear runway left underneath for two more takeoffs. Again, suited to its special job, this is a fast climbing airplane. In gloomy weather, lifting its passengers up to smooth air and sunshine in a matter of minutes. At flight altitude, far above any hilltop along the route, when the crew levels off and locks the automatic pilot into one of the beams which pattern the sky with invisible electronic highways, the Convair is carrying its people and their goods in comfort and safety at four miles or more per minute. All kinds of people on all kinds of errands. At this moment of the air over almost half the states of the nation, the conveyors of this one airline are thundering their daily proof that no longer is the sky for the few, nor even for the many. Now the sky is for everyone. The sky is for everyone up in the San Joaquin Valley, in Sacramento, Stockton, Fresno, Bakersfield. Skies for Walter McKibben. Last year, his power tool business outgrew its factory in the city. A valley town invited him to build up there. The problem? He still have to spend two days a week down at his old sales headquarters. The answer? The airline. With room for a more efficient layout and pleasanter working conditions, the new plant's turning out more tools at lower unit costs. Most of Walter's key employees moved up here with him, and they like it. Their kids will grow up in an environment that would have been out of their reach down in the city. Walter himself can live in a relaxing, country sort of home that would have been an hour's nerve-wracking traffic drive from his old location. His business done, the trip that once would have kept him two nights away from home now finds him returning the same evening with dinner on the plane and time for bridge or a movie with Mrs. McKibben and young Walt. The new luggage rack right in the cabin even lets him walk straight to his cab without waiting for baggage out front. The sky is even for people who never ride the airplanes, but who benefit from others who do. In cities like Salt Lake, Ogden, Elko, Reno. Doctors in cities distant from the metropolitan hospital centers, doctors like Bob Joyce, once found it hard to keep up to date on the new things. Professional magazines and local meetings are fine, but the specialist still wants clinic work in one of the big medical centers. Mrs. Joyce approves of the clinic trips, especially in the first part of the week when she can go along with the doctor at the family half fair. Half fair, but full comfort. Early this morning, Dr. Joyce made his essential calls. He's traveled what would have been a full day's trip by car and he still has a full afternoon ahead for the kind of work that keeps him in touch with everything new in his profession. And tomorrow morning, he'll be back in his practice, ready for whatever new problems the day may bring. The sky is for every merchant. For merchants in Cheyenne, Scotts Bluff, North Platte, Grand Island, Lincoln, Today, women in Convair cities are as smartly dressed and shod on Main Street as they could be on Fifth Avenue. There are bigger shops than Brissac's, but few smarter. Brissac's displays are as fresh and varied, thanks to the air, as any in the metropolis. Perhaps even a little ahead, since Margaret Brissac knows her customers as friends and shops for them as individuals. 
be no check for this meal. No tips to the attendants. Margaret Brissack flies to Chicago and New York for actually less money than she can travel by Pullman. The schedules are arranged to bring the conveyors into their terminals for quick connections with mainline flights anywhere in the country. Or the world, for that matter. Margaret Brissack, however, will lay over one flight for a quick visit to her Chicago wholesalers. With no problems on her mind about luggage transfer, since the tag on that smart green case will automatically transfer it to the non-stop DC-6 or DC-7 that she'll go out on. Destination New York. Like buyers for more and more department stores and specialty shops in Convair cities, Margaret Brissack uses the airplane to visit the top metropolitan stylists and wholesalers several times a year without having to be away from the store for more than a couple of days at a time. And Air Express, with its next day delivery service for odd size items, lets her keep down her inventory the same time, she increases the variety of her styles and models, and everybody wins. The sky is for everyone who likes good living. In South Bend, Fort Wayne, Toledo, Cleveland. The Farleys like good living, and they can afford it. And Mrs. Farley particularly wants Joan to get a broad background of gracious living before she marries next year and settles down to a young family. For good living, New York has more restaurants, but none much better than a couple right here in town for luxury foods. Tonight's special lobsters come to Victor's by conveyor only one day from the cold salt water of Maine. The orchids for tonight's corsage. Two days ago, we're still growing on a tropic vine in Honolulu, and when a good play opens on Broadway. Or Mrs. Farley just gets a little restless. New York is only a few hours away. Comfortable hours, even luxurious hours. With the cabin pressurized to a pleasant altitude and ventilated with air conditioning that cools or warms without uncomfortable drafts. Pleasant hours. Reclining seats of foam rubber and big double paned windows that never fog up to obscure the scenery below. Four miles and more every minute. And yet up here you hardly realize you're moving. This morning a golf course in Ohio. Tonight, a play in New York. Tomorrow and Saturday more of that background with Joan. And home Sunday morning in time for church. The sky is for everyone who must be in two places at once. The troubleshooters from the industries of Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, Bradford, Olean, from Youngstown, Warren, Sharon, from Akron, Canton. To a factory in Ohio comes an urgent call from a mine in Nevada, where the old mine cars are being replaced with a new rubber railroad. On a big job like this, every day counts. Rush out your top man. But Nevada's two days away by train. And the top man is due on a job in Cuba four days from now. Not long ago, a department head would have had to reach for an answer. Now he reaches for a phone. But one man's answer may be another man's headache. It's exactly that to George Crockett, the troubleshooter, who has a date with Mrs. Crockett three days from now date he made 10 years ago. Well, what do you do? You know what you do. You're in business, a job is in trouble, so you do what the man says. an easy connection to Chicago with a non-stop west. Plenty of time to think out the job while you ride. And maybe, just maybe, if 
the deal doesn't run into any snags. <sighs> it's wonderful how much brighter the world looks after that second cup of hot coffee. Out on the job. There'll be no pushover, but none of them are. And there's still two days to the Big Ten. Let's get at it, son. The hours go by. A few snags, a couple of breaks. With the Big Ten now one day away. Two thousand miles out, a job of work done, two thousand miles back. It would have been five days at the least by train or car, and you're back home in three. Nice for the man who signs your paycheck. Nicer still for you and the lady who helps you spend it. The sky is for everyone who travels to sell. From Moline, Davenport, Rock Island, from Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, Des Moines. The new combination of multiple stop air routes and the rental automobile is bringing about a quiet revolution among traveling salesmen. Vincent Harris is a good example. Harris used to travel a territory roughly 300 miles across. He drove his own car. He was always away from home except for weekends. As his kids grew, they began to ask who was that nice man who came to visit mommy on Sundays. He never thought of flying until the time young Vinny got run over and in the emergency had to leave his car and come home by plane. Now he's a commuter. Let's see, today's Wednesday. Harris covered his northern towns Monday and Tuesday. He spent last night at home, had a good sleep in his own bed, and he's relaxing on this early morning ride to start his East End calls, fresh and fit. Of course, he needs a car out there. But now he orders a rental car when he picks up his ticket. And it's waiting for him when he gets off the plane. His regular air travel charge card is both credit reference and charge plate. And in this locality, the car costs him 10 cents a mile and $7 a day, which in his case figures out at around $2 a call. a.m. He's 200 miles from home, and this is his third call in the morning. He'll have a leisurely lunch with a fourth customer and be on the road again before he could even have reached town under the old system of driving his own car from home. And he's still fresh and fit. His territory's been expanded until now he covers three states. Expenses up little or nothing. Earnings up a lot. return trip, he'll write up his orders and reports, be able to lock his business in his briefcase before Jeannie and the thundering herd meet him at the airport for another night with his family instead of alone in some distant hotel. It's a whole new way of life. The sky's for everyone who wants double pleasure on a vacation from Philadelphia. From Toledo, Milwaukee, Moline, Des Moines, Omaha. Two years ago, Mary and Bates and her gang drove to New Orleans for their vacation. It was fun, but the drive used up three days each way, and their sightseeing down south was pretty crowded. Last year, California, same problem. This year, says Marion, it'll be different. Very different indeed. Well, at last, it's actually happening. For two whole weeks, no dictation, no comptometers, no filing folders, but Hawaiian guitars, the magic of orchids under a golden tropic moon. And not improbably, four tall, tanned, and terrific young men. Diamond Head, with 12 full days,
days out of this two weeks on that beach at Waikiki. And since a girl has to be practical, it's with hotel, tours, everything wrapped up in a package, including round-trip plane fare, all for not much more than the cost of an ordinary vacation. This is living. And for a final touch, a nice blustery homecoming to tee off the tales of the South Sea sun. The sky is for everyone who has relatives to visit. Like a certain nice elderly couple on a farm between Providence and Hartford. There are two grandchildren out west now, and that's quite an attraction. After Dad's operation, he wasn't too eager for that long ride on the train. But ever since Graham and the son-in-law got him into the air for the first time, there's been no holding him. He and Graham make the trip twice a year now, but every time there's the same old argument about the luggage. Graham always figures there's room for another present or a fudge cake in the 40-pound baggage allowance. Dad's always just as sure that this time she's stretching it too far. Of course, there's 80 pounds on the two tickets, but Dad's always been a careful man. The bag does lift a little heavy. Now, it'll be worth a dollar or two excess to tell the kids if he told Graham once, he told her a thousand times. 39 and a half pounds, Mr. Wilcox. flying DC-3s when the folks first started making the trip. But Graham likes the easy stairs of the conveyor, the way the cabin floor stays level when the plane's on the ground. Every trip, Graham asked the captain the same question. She never has gotten squared away on this pressurization thing. Well, it seems that the airplane is flying high in the smooth, thin air, 12, 14,000 feet, but the cabin under pressure inside, you might say, is flying less than a third that high which is why your ears don't pop anymore when the plane lets down for a landing. Tired? Who's tired? But the train they might have taken is still a day and a night away. A trip that long, a man might get tired. The sky's for everyone who would like to make a trip east for free. San Diego, Long Beach, Salinas. The sky may be for everyone, but a big chunk of private sky is reserved at the moment for Wally French and the very new Mrs. French. This is one of those moments. And they're nice kids, they'll do well. In fact, they may do very well indeed, because though their heads and hearts are high in the sky at this point, Wally's feet are always solidly on the ground. We can go anywhere on our honeymoon, Wally figured, so what's the matter with Detroit? What's so special about Detroit, said Margaret. So they make automobiles there, said Wally. We're buying a new car anyway, so we take delivery at the factory, and the $300 or so we save on freight, we'll buy our flights east and pay a good share of our expenses on the drive home. We'll see Bryce and Zion on the Grand Canyon. How can we lose? Uh-huh, you can. If you keep your feet dug deep in the ground when you stop at Vegas. And the sky is for everyone in the big distances of the Pacific Northwest. Twin Falls. Boise, Pendleton, Spokane, Walla Walla, Medford, Eugene, Salem, Portland, Seattle, Tacoma, Bellingham, Vancouver. The clouds and fog which occasionally obscure these airports are no longer the old problem because with ILS, the instrument landing system, the 
captain takes his ship down through the clouds on a pair of matched electronic beams as surely as though he were going downstairs with his hand on the banister, knowing through his constant radio contact with ground control that no other airplanes are anywhere in his vicinity. ILS works quite simply. A slim vertical beam, the banister, keeps the plane from straying to right or left. A flat beam, the stairway, slants upward from the end of the airport runway to make a gently sloping glide path. Two marker beams shoot up vertically to announce the distance to the touchdown point. And when the nose of the airplane pushes through the underside of the overcast, it's pointed directly into the head of the runway. The twin beams make their foot-by-foot -foot reports to the pilots on an instrument as clear to read as an automobile speedometer. The horizontal needle tells the pilots whether the airplane is above or below the sloping stairway. The vertical needle reports whether it's to the right or left of the guiding banister. When the two needles cross at right angles, the plane must break out under the overcast with its nose on the correct glide angle to the touchdown point of the runway. No longer a problem to the conveyors is rain or ice or snow on a short runway. When the giant blades of those two propellers reverse their pitch and push against the air rather than pull, an airplane slows down right now. Like the baggage, Convair cargo necessarily travels on passenger schedules. And business concerns along the route ship and receive a surprising variety of goods. Perishables like baby chicks and tree-ripened fruit. Replacement machine parts to beat costly shutdowns. All manner of goods which the local merchants fly in to give big city service to their patrons without loading their shelves with slow-moving inventory. This one Convair flight carried a typical assortment. New line of shoes, a show dog, live tropical fish, tonight's drive-in film, water heater, emergency machine parts, apparel fill-ins, electric appliances, and fresh cut flowers. With this new airplane, the sky is not only for everyone, it's for everything. It's for more gracious living. It's for the good things. It's for the freshening of family ties and for the fuller use of rare skills. It's for the travel one couldn't otherwise afford and for keeping in step with the march of progress. It's for running a city factory in country air, for bringing Fifth Avenue to Maine and Elm and making vacation dreams come true. And it's for stretching the calendar so that men who travel can do their job of work and still have time left over to live with their families like any other husbands or fathers. No longer is the sky for the few. No longer even for the many. Today, the sky is for everyone. The sky for you.